I'm Peter Nixon, host of Dialogue Matters, a blog for current and emerging leaders wanting to resolve conflicts, realize opportunities, and manage change. In the first vlog of this series, I explained Dialogue Gap and how it causes people to respond in negative ways. I then suggested how leaders should respond with dialogue and negotiation. In the second vlog, I explained the Dialogue Puzzle, a fast, effective, and practical way to prepare for your most difficult dialogues. Today we're focusing on managing negative emotions in ourselves and in others, because if we can't manage the emotions, we cannot succeed. I went away to college when I was 17, and I had never lived on my own prior to that, and as a typical young male with the freedom to do whatever I wanted, I got a little bit out of control. At some point in my first term, I guess my father had recognized this, so he sent me a handwritten note, which I taped to my mirror, and I looked at and read every day. The note said, you want to succeed, and you will. Manage talent, training, time, money, energy, and people. Most important of all, learn to control your emotions to enhance your situation rather than hinder it. Sounded like practical advice. It sounded like something I needed to learn how to do. But the note didn't come with instructions, and I spent the next 35 years trying to figure out how exactly should people go about to control their emotions to enhance their situation rather than hinder it. In today's vlog, I share some of the things that I've learned about managing emotions in hope that they'll help you be a better leader and to better manage your own situations. Let's first talk about the conflict sequence we tend to get upset for one of uh, three reasons. Primarily, first of all, we don't uh, get what we want. Secondly, we might find that we're upset because bad things happen to good people. And thirdly, we tend to get upset when there's an injustice of some kind. How much each of these three situations affect you depends on your primary motivational style. We're all motivated in different degrees by wanting to achieve results, manage relationships, or uh, rationale. People primarily motivated by results tend to react more strongly when they don't get what they want. Those who are primarily motivated by relationships tend to react more strongly when they see bad things happening to good people. And those primarily motivated by rationale tend to get more upset when they face injustices of some kind. This classification is really a simplification because people are actually a lot more complex, but it helps us understand and it helps us understand how to move forward. We're all actually a blend of these three motivations and our reactions tend to change as stress and conflict escalates. The stress meter, which appears on the wall behind me, is actually a, a useful way to help us understand how we change as the situation escalates from dialogue into silence and violence. An easy way to see this change is by using colors. Consider, for example, that red represents a results preference, green represents a preference for rationale, and blue a preference for uh, relationships. Now, as showing on the screen, the color chart, which you can see moves from Stage zero is when you're feeling calm to stage three when you're effectively out of control or very upset. Uh, colors change. Our behavior changes in predictable ways. And we help leaders and we help teams understand how their behaviors change and how this either helps or hinders their situations. Let me also explain something about the concept of two arrows. It's said that when bad things happen, it's like we're hit by two different arrows. First the, is the arrow of the incident itself. The second arrow is our reaction to what has happened. We cannot normally do anything about the first arrow, and as they say, shit happens. Apologies. We can, however, learn to manage our reaction and prevent getting hit by that second arrow. So if you think, for example, of a child that makes a mistake and the mistake angers their parent, and the parent decides to hit the child in reaction to what the, they feel that the child has caused them to be upset. 
and you'll understand then what I'm talking about. The child, the first arrow, child children make mistakes. The second arrow, the parent's reaction, doesn't have to be that way. But our ability to manage our emotional reactions is something that comes with time and learning and practice. Our reactions are often much worse than what happens in the first place. The second arrow often causes more pain than the first. How often have you regretted something that you said or something that you did in reaction to something that's happened to you or happened to the people around you? Another expression that my father shared with me regularly was to keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Leaders listening to this podcast will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Like a lighthouse in the storm, effective leaders do something on a daily basis to maintain their equanimity, their calm in the midst of this storm at the office or storm at work or storm at home or storm outside in their communities. What I've learned that can help you maintain your equanimity or your calm in the face of the storm are some of the 40 tactics which uh, I will share. But let's first consider the situation here in Hong Kong right now and how the first and second arrows have, have affected the stakeholders' emotions. I'll then share some of these 40 tactics to give you an idea on how you can better manage your own reactions in some of those tough situations you're facing. Going back 10 years or so, electoral reform in Hong Kong came to an end. That could be said to be the first arrow. This eventually led to the 2014 Occupy movement and uh, the basic indifference by the Hong Kong government, which perhaps would be the second arrows for each of those two groups. As time marched on, several more incidents caused the emotions to flare amongst Hong Kong residents, leading to the current protest. This time, protesters were much more violent than before. And the Hong Kong government ignored their demands and began arresting protesters. In order to keep the roads of Hong Kong open, the Hong Kong police have fired thousands of canisters of tear gas, and Beijing has told the world it supports the crackdown on the protesters. So, having worked with thousands of leaders in Hong Kong, we know the most common reactions of Hong Kongers under stress. And as you can see from the color chart appearing on your screen now, in the absence of dialogue and negotiation and without ways to contain their emotions, people in Hong Kong eventually erupt into action and push for results. That's equally true for government as it is for protesters and for the police. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now in the streets of Hong Kong. They're all behaving as they would be expected to behave and it's not helping one bit. On screen now are some 40 tactics that can help you de-escalate your stress and conflict either in yourselves or others or both. Here are three that I think can be particularly helpful. Number 15, stop thinking me versus you and start thinking us. Once the protesters and the government accept that they need to work on this together, it'll be a lot easier for dialogue to start. Protesters need the government to engage in dialogue. They can't do it alone. And government leaders should recognize that the protesters will be paying their pensions in just a few short years. Tactic number 20 suggests that we should apologize and admit our mistakes. All sides, I think, have things to apologize for in this protest. And it's clear that unless honest uh, reflection and apologies are offered, from each of the different groups, it will be very hard to see how the fault lines dividing Hong Kong will end anytime soon. And a third tactic, number 23, invites stakeholders to be compassionate about the other situations. So consider for a moment, perhaps the Hong Kong government should reflect on what it feels like for two million residents of Hong Kong to be ignored by their own government leaders or how it must feel for the police officers to have to attack their own citizens. Let's reflect on the Hong Kong police for a moment and uh, think about how they must feel for the fall in reputation from being amongst the most highly respected professionals in the city 
to being hated by many of the residents today. Or think how the Hong Kong police might consider the government officers think that the police are taking personal hits for effective, ineffective government leadership in this situation. The protesters can also reflect. They might think about how senior government officials must find it very hard to walk this line between what uh, Beijing is demanding of them and what their fellow citizens are demanding of them. Knowing that if you favor one group over the other, the other group will hate you. Protesters can also feel for the police at the moment who are increase, increasingly quitting the ranks disillusioned by how their jobs of protecting citizens have morphed into uh, actually shooting canisters at their fellow residents. So in conclusion, as we become mindful of our own emotions and those of the people around us, we'll gain a much greater level of equanimity and this will help us as we move into dialogue to resolve conflict, realize opportunities, or uh, manage change. In my next vlog, I'll explain dialogue skills and suggest a few of these skills that might currently be missing in the Hong Kong context. Viewers wanting to learn more about equanimity and dialogue skills are invited to download and read my book and bestseller, Dialogue Gap. I'm Peter Nixon, inviting you to forward this vlog to people that you think might benefit in or outside of government and the local protest. Feel free to comment and subscribe if you wish to follow me. I'll see you in the next edition of Dialogue Matters.